This week on the Innovators Insider Podcast, we're going to talk about the nefarious iceberg of total cost of ownership. You know, iceberg right ahead. You know, everybody who knows that line, we're going to talk about that, how to avoid the iceberg in the world of CAD and PDM. Um, we're also going to show off a cool model of the week. You know, it'll be uh, something you may have seen before. It's, a, it's an oldie bit of goodie. And then uh, uh, we'll talk about the Onshape user group, of course, read by led by Richard Doyle. But uh, most importantly here, uh, Richard, I, I think, you know, we, we, I'd love for you to introduce uh, a guest that we have, a very uh, uh, wonderful friend of Onshape. Um, but, I, you know, I'll, I'll let you take it away, Richard. Uh, sure. And he is an absolute uh, wonderful friend of Onshape. Um, Chad Stoltfus uh, has done many uh, presentations for us at our user group meetings. He's a feature script expert, and uh, his presentation on learning feature script uh, was one of the most popular that we've had at our user group meetings. Um, so, everybody, please welcome Chad Stolfus. Chad, I've heard you. Uh, I've heard you describe yourself as not a CAD guy, who loves on shape. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, I would describe myself that way. That's true. Um, I would say on shape was very alluring to me. Uh, as a software developer, because uh, I, I don't I don't come from any CAD background. Uh, I come from a software engineering background, uh, and was kind of roped into Onshape because uh, the company I work for, Premier Custom Build, really wanted to jump into 3D modeling, and we didn't see it happening with our highly customized product without uh, having a highly customizable CAD system. And that's kind of how we really got into Onshape, and that's. That's where I started to fit in, where I can I can put my own touch on a CAD system. I can kind of see and have this vision of a CAD tool and try to carry it out. And there's a lot of really fun problem solving uh, in CAD programming that's very different than traditional application development. So obviously, then your your feature <laughs> your focus is on feature script. Uh, for our audience that may not may not know what feature script is, can you kind of describe it a little bit and, and explain what it does? Yeah, so uh, feature script is a programming language that's kind of the backbone of Onshape. Uh, all the standard tools that you use, whether it's Extrude or Loft or Chamfer, uh, those are all powered by and programmed in feature script. And it's a language that Onshape has made open source that you can actually use to create your own custom CAD tools. And it's a little bit different from a macro uh, in other CAD systems. And the way that it's different is you can provide logic and business rules to create built-in CAD tools that are integrated into the system. And visually, they work the exact same way as any other CAD tool uh, that you're used to using. And so the really alluring thing about that is you can develop CAD tools that feel like they were made specifically for you and are fully integrated into the CAD system. Wow. Well, Michael, you're the, you're the technical guy here, so I'll bet you have some good technical questions for Chad. Yeah. Yeah. Chad, I mean, feature script is something that it, that is really appealing and it, and it's almost, you know, created a, a almost a new job description in the world of CAD management and uh, and, and deployments, right? You know, it's uh, you know you, you mentioned yourself not being like a, a CAD guy, but but you were able to to improve your fellow engineers' uh, lives. You know, how how has the addition? You know, it's been it's been quite some time now since you guys have used uh, started using Onshape, but how is it if you harken back to the early days? How, how has it changed the way you guys go about building products, you know, in in your company? You know, and, and maybe, you know, explain to us a little bit more about what exactly your your company does with uh, with FeatureScript. Yeah, and I, I think explaining what we do and where we're trying to go involves a little bit of where we started. Um, we hopped into Onshape uh, only doing 2D CAD. At first, we come from another CAD system where we only did 2D drawings in that system. Um, and so moving into Onshape, as a 3D system, a lot of our processes and a lot of the ways we think about models change. I mean, in a 2D CAD system, you're not really worried about parametric modeling. You're not really worried about fully defining every aspect of a part. You, you just care about lines. Um, 
And on top of that, the type of product that we create, you know, we we create fully customizable kitchens on demand. So it's not like we're storing, uh, it's not like we have parts in stock that we assemble together uh, when we get an order. No, we build all of our parts to each spe- each specific job. Um, so quite frankly, I feel like everything in our design process has has changed, um, for, which can be intimidating in some aspects, but really really eye-opening in another. Um, we went from a traditional file-based system to a cloud-based system. Uh, that that changes how we think about document structure and organization. Um, we've gone into a collaborative CAD system, so now we can consider hiring on uh, other roles to work on this highly customizable job uh, in parallel. Uh, we can be more consistent with our workflows because we're not just kind of handing off uh, drawings to individual engineers. And also we've, we can now define our product somewhere. It was very difficult for us to define our product before uh, because we had so many different specifications and so many different layouts and, oh, well, if this happens, then go do this thing. If this happens, then do another thing. And and now we can def- fully define those using combinations of custom features and configurations. And now we have these extremely robust configurations that tell us everything about a model. Where before, when I first started working at Premiere, uh, I had to go out to the shop floor to figure out how things were built. If there was a complex face frame and I didn't understand it from the 2D drawing, had to go ask <laughs> enough people until I understood it. Right, right. And... So, so it's fair to say now that, you know, you probably have a digital twin for every product that you've sold, you know, using the Onshape platform because each one is, you know, you have the configuration parameters for it now. You can, you can easily kind of pull up a, a design that you might have built for a customer maybe three or four years ago and, and show them exactly, you know, what they ordered in case they needed a replacement part or, or something like that, I would guess, right? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we have occasional make afters where you know we might have uh, a product design need updated, or we might have you know they they might have faulty conditions uh, due to things like wood warping, depending on how old the job is. Um, so yeah, we we have the ability to go back and look at those things. And, and something else is because we're building all of these uh, specifications on demand. Sometimes we might have a specification like a custom door that's made for a particular job. Um, well, what if we want to use that custom door on a new job? Well, now we just go grab it from its original location. And now Ah, you kind of have that history with the door. So you're like, Oh, I'm using this custom door in a new job. Well, where did that custom door come from? You can kind of go back through that digital trail and see where it came from, which is really, that's, that's so, that's very new for us to have that all in one place because before a lot of communication had to happen to find those, pa- those, di- those digital and paper trails. <laughs> you know, Michael, one of the questions we were going to ask Chad is, have you saved any time or money uh, by implementing feature script? I think that's uh, that question's kind of moot at this point. Uh, I think Chad's probably proven that yes, they have saved plenty of time, which equates to saving plenty of money. Um, Chad, for somebody that's new to, to programming, um, do you have any tips for somebody that might want to learn feature script? Yeah. Um, I think Onshape has done a great job of providing documentation and examples that even if you're not a programming guy, um, it's, it's pretty simple to go in there and start learning. Um, so my number one tip is to look, is to look at those examples. If there's custom features that you use actively, um, you can actually go to the document where that feature lives in, open up the feature studio that's in there and see how they accomplished a tool that you're familiar with. Uh, You can do the same thing by going to the standard library source code and looking at, and you can see tons of examples of how Onshape used feature script to make the extrude feature or to make the loft feature. You can see how they built the UI. You can see, you know, how they're sectioning off blocks of code. and another tip I would have is there's a ton of resources out there. Use all of them that that's available to you. Um, there's there's pages on um, on Shape site like FSDoc and the standard library documentation that give 
ex explanations in English of how blocks of code can be used. Uh, the forum is also a great place. Um, there's plenty of great people willing to help and answer questions. Uh, I'll also volunteer myself. If you have any questions, uh, reach out, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to help out people with that. And, and last, I would say, try to come up with some ideas of custom features that you might see a use for. Uh, try and identify some repetitious tasks that you might find yourself doing for, for your workflow. For example, we, we commonly would add a fixed floor into a cabinet, and that's just a simple set, sketch and extrude, but we did it so often that we created a custom feature that does just that. So start with something simple and kind of try to automate that. Great. Right, thank you. Well, before we let you go, we've learned an awful lot about what you do and how you do it. What about your free time? <laughs> What do you do? Uh, what do you do for fun, Jack? Yeah, um, for fun. I mean, I I really do enjoy food adventures of any kind. You know, I love trying new places. Um, I love trying dishes and flavor combinations I've never had. I also enjoy cooking uh, a fair amount. Um, love coming home on a Friday night, whipping up some carbonara. You know, really <laughs> relaxing some rich food. Um, I also uh, am part of a whiskey tasting group. Uh, we meet uh, the fourth Friday of every month, and we have different themes. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's part of what I do as well. Um, also, I am an Onshape ambassador, so uh, I like to get involved with Onshape, see what's all going on in the CAD industry, and kind of learn as much as I can because there's a lot to learn. <laughs> that That's a great point, well, Chad. Actually, you know, can you maybe share – with the community what an on-shape ambassador is and you know perhaps uh you know maybe we, there are other people out there listening who might also want to be an ambassador yeah for sure um so on-shape ambassador is a rel the on-shape amb ambassador program is a relatively new program um and it's essentially a group of uh dedicated on-shape users that really just want to see on-shape continue to improve uh, and there are things like access to some early visibility programs. Um, there's opportunities to interact with the Onshape community. Uh, inside of our Slack channel, we'll be sharing popular models, popular custom features. Um, there's some networking involved in there. It's, it's almost like a, an ongoing user group <laughs> in, in a way. <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Thanks for, for sharing that, Chad. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I, I've seen, you know, who's in that group, and, it, and it's a it's a really good who's who of of really good, important on shape users that have really helped uh, us over the years. We hope that you know we've been able to help you as well. But it's uh, it's really gratifying to to see you and, and the rest of the community, you know, you know, offering your 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 advice and your your thoughts on things. So it's it's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And I'll re reiterate that as well. Um, thanks for the presentations that you do at the user group meetings, all the works in the forums. Um, and it's been a pleasure to, to have you on the show today. Uh, really great interview. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. All right. Well, we hope you'll stick around, Chad. Mm -hmm. um, we've got quite a, quite a bit of stuff left here. Uh, I think we're going to go over to Michael right now and talk about the total cost of ownership of your CAD system. Absolutely. Yeah, so... I'm going to see if I can make this, uh, this share thing happen. So uh, do a screen share of this window. We're going to see a duplicate of the screen here for a second. Sorry for the trip there. Okay, there we are. <laughs> so um, a couple weeks back, I ran a webinar on something that's kind of near and dear to my heart as I was a CAD administrator for a long time. Go, go back to the... Uh, uh, episode, uh, well, the first episode, actually, when uh, Richard and I kind of go through our history a little bit, you could hear a little bit more about, um, you know, our paths. And, and they were kind of similar, you know, CAD administration, you know, usually the, the CAD guy who's like the youngest and, you know, the one that's the most knowledgeable about, you know, CAD stuff ends up being the CAD administrator at the company that you might be working for. And that happened to me. So I got suckered in. Um, but you know, I wouldn't be sitting where I am now with, without all that. So I, I really do appreciate going through it all, you know, the school hard knocks, but, but, you know, it, it's something that, you know, comes up a lot, especially when people are considering switching from one CAD system to another, they want to, you know, there's the devil they know, and then the devil they don't know. Right. So, um, 
you know, sometimes the devil you know, you really don't know that well. And, and that's really what the point of this webinar was. I'm not going to go give the whole webinar here, but there were a couple of key points that I wanted to draw out um, and, and offer up for discussion, you know, here while we have people on the line that, that also have, you know, some of these, um, you know, things that, that they've seen over the years, right? So, you know, a lot of people, when they think about the total cost of ownership, they're just thinking of the tip of the iceberg, right? You know, they're only thinking of what, what the check they're writing is to their software vendor, you know, each year for the privilege of having a, a license to a copy of CAD software that you install in your local computer. Um, so that that's where most people stop thinking about costs. You know, really forward thinking people sometimes start thinking about the hardware costs and the workstations. And then, you know, if you really start thinking about it, there, there's a lot more we'll get into. But the two other things that people forget about completely are, you know, the, the costs of using or not using the system that you're you're on and the things that it prevents you from doing, right? So like everybody knows about CAD software costs. So I'm not gonna go deep into this. The webinar does go deeper into this, but there's this it's not just the price of the CAD software that you have to worry about. You actually have to think about other things like, you know, where in the world are you using this CAD software? You know, if you have a global organization, which is quite common nowadays. Um, you know, there's this floating license tax. Like if you start floating licenses around the world, you, you, you really can't do that unless you pay a, a, a tax, you know, if you will. And, you know, the webinar talks about that. Um, and by the way, the price of CAD software is typically different in different parts of the world too. And that's another thing you have to consider the price that you pay for CAD system X in Pennsylvania will be different than what you pay for it in France. Right. And, and by quite a bit in some cases, which is really surprising. Um, but if you're a company that has any kind of data management software um, to help manage the, the gigabytes of files that are being generated by all your engineers, that's a big cost, right? You have the cost of the software on top of your CAD software. You have the cost of the subscription. You have the cost of the, the IT related software for running you know, SQL Server and stuff. That's what these old school PDM kind of CAD systems will run. They'll run Microsoft SQL Server, not like modern kind of things, you know, that are out there now with like MongoDB and non-relational databases that that handle large amounts of data better and, in a more secure way. Um, but um, there's other costs too with PDM software. If you've ever implemented one, you know, they, you usually have help from your the person that you bought it from. <laughs> and they'll, they'll come in and help you set it up for, you know, instead of you spending six months to do it, you know, you'll have them come in and do some of the grunt work, you know, three to five days, typically $10,000, you know, to get started there and then $10,000 if you want to start doing migration. So there's all these other little costs peppered in, you know, to think about. Um, but those are just the software costs, right? Um, like the hardware that goes in to running a CAD workstation really has to be something considered uh greatly right i mean richard you 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 were telling me the you know earlier about your uh your dell workstation maybe maybe you can go into that story it, so yeah so uh, you know i've been using a laptop workstation for a long time because i used to travel a lot and do a lot of presentations um so you know i was so excited when i replaced my dell m60 with my dell m90 you know it was <laughs> Powerful, had the right graphics card. Yeah, it weighed 300 pounds, and the and the brick, the power brick weighed about the same. But you know, I carried that thing around because it was powerful, and I needed it. And then two and a half years later, with a software update, not anything to do with the hardware at all, but it was a software update of the the CAD software I was using, obsoleted my machine. You know. It, it, when I started designing my tiny house and when I decided I wanted to do that, uh, there was really only one option for me as far as CAD software goes because I had a $200 computer that I bought at a used computer store. And so the only option for me was Onshape. Yeah, I mean, it's really pretty much OS agnostic. People run it on Chromebooks quite often because, you know, it's, there's no files ever stored there. It's a secure device. It's cost effective you know you can you can literally i think we did a blog article you know a few years back where we had our uh my colleague uh, neil cook 
uh, from, from the UK, you know, long, long time CAD veteran. Um, and he, he went out, he went to the uh, local, uh, you know, electronic store, bought a Chromebook uh, and unboxed it. Three minutes later, he was inside of his Onshape account, right? You know, after unboxing the, the Chromebook, right? And that's, that's unheard of, right? <laughs> when, when you're dealing with hardware, you know, tr- traditional kind of installation, uh, you know, you, you know, if you can, if you're lucky enough to have an IT department that'll help you kind of get up and running really quickly, and you know, the whole process of actually procuring a subscription of Onshape, you, you could literally call us up and say we want a license, and then like five minutes later, you, you're in with your full professional account. Compare that to a traditional install-based software where it could be at least a week. You know, if you're really lucky before you get access to the the licensing codes and everything you need to get started. Those are some of the opportunity costs, right? If you think about it, is, you know, that cost isn't built into the, you know, the check that you're writing to the vendor. That's a cost on your side that you have to build in buffer time for in your product development process. And, and buffer time needs to be eliminated. You know, it's, it's my new hashtag that I'm starting to use more often is just, you know, buffer time this and buffer time that. It's really something that people include because they they think there's no other you know thing right so so that you know there's lots of hardware costs you know it's not just you know the actual cost of buying the cad workstation and keeping it up there's the servers there's you know if you have a cad desktop you might also have a cad laptop that you need to buy to be mobile um, there's all the networking equipment you might say to yourself you have all this equipment but typically cad networking requires more bandwidth more more speed, you know, higher availability and uptime, which means higher cost, uh, more professional mission critical equipment needs to be purchased versus, you know, your standard off the shelf stuff, right? Um, you know, here's, here's our friends from uh, Solid Box. You know, they make very good CAD workstations here. And this is a list of, you know, what they recommend for a traditional CAD um, software. These systems work just fine for Onshape, by the way. You know, in fact, they'll work admirably because, you know, the, the graphics, you know, we take advantage of graphics cards and stuff like that with Onshape, but it's just not a, you know, hardcore requirement, you know, to have it only if you're doing like massive assemblies and stuff. Um, but, you know, what we get into the webinar quite deeply uh, about is talking about the efficiency costs, right? You know, this, I love this Jenga tower because it make you know, the Jenga tower analogy is, is something that's really, uh, you know, holds true, I think, when you're designing an install-based parametric software. Like, if you pull the wrong uh, Jenga timber out of the tower, you know, you, you've you lost all your work. You, cr- you crash your system. You lose your files that you haven't saved for the last few changes. You have to redo the work again, right? It, it's, you know, time reporting bug issues to, the, to, to your local uh, vendor, you know, and then packaging up all the files and the logs and all that, you know, that takes a lot of time. And that's stuff that you will never experience in a cloud native application like Onshape. You don't have a crash per se, you know, all software crashes, but the way we've built the system on the back end is fairly crash tolerant and the end users typically won't notice it. You know, if it does happen, you know, it's it's taken care of very quickly because we can push out deployments of any bug fixes worldwide in in, in minutes. You know, I mean, it, and the whole world is fixed, not just the person applying the hot patch, right? So it's it's really a uh, something that you should really consider when thinking about your budget to your time on engineering efficiency and the cost of your CAD system. Yeah, I won't go too deep into anything else there, but I really just wanted to kind of give you a teaser for for that webinar. Um, you know, it's uh, it goes into us a bit more deeply in, into the cost. There's actually uh, some case study examples that we've uh, you know, built with some of our customers to kind of have some uh, straw man, you know, kind of, um, you know, total costs that they would have. Um, so definitely check that out. You know, we'll put a link to it here uh in in the recording you know later on uh, but but know that you know when you go to a cloud native system you know it's typically there there are no more silos more people can do work together it's simply more convenient one of my customers told me you know on a, on a previous webinar that's just more convenient it's just you know, less things to think about bring your own device I should spell that right, right. 
and uh, the release management capabilities. Um, if you want to like release things to Rev A and Rev B, you're not blocked by all this crazy check in check out process. You know, it's just easy to you know release something to manufacturing with the appropriate sign offs and approvals, and it, you know you're never blocked by anybody's inaction or anything like that. It's uh, it's something that saves a lot of time for our customers. Um, so really, that that's really why I want to talk about tease tease that webcast a little bit. Give it a give it a watch if if you have uh, about forty forty five minutes or so. Um, it, it's really a you know pretty enlightening, I think. So um, that is what I wanted to talk about there. Um, Richard, I think we wanted to talk about the the model of the week yet. Next, was that what we wanted to do? Uh, we could do that. We could talk about user groups. Uh, let's do the model of the week. Right? Yeah, let's do the model of the week, then we'll talk about the user groups. So uh, model of the week this week, I'm just uh, you know browsing around before we started uh, the podcast here. You know, maybe we'll have something more official in the future for you know identifying these based on what people are asking about or, or mentioning in, in the forums and things like that. But you know, here is the Onshape uh, public space, which is a uh, it's really cool because you can find lots of different kind of inspirational examples um, as well as other custom features. You can see there's some feature script functions here, like to create a belt and a spur gear, you know, fairly common. You can sort this by, you know, how many times something's been used uh, or how many people have liked it. Right. So, you know, it's pretty fun, easy way of finding uh, things. Um, and I wanted to open this one up just because I remember this as being a really good example um, Back in the early days of Onshape, we were, we were working with um, Form Labs, and, and Form Labs took, you know, of course, you know, a famous kind of 3D printer company. They uh, shared this model publicly, um, Brian Chan. Um, and it was a, a really nice case study on how you could develop, you know, acoustically, you know, correct, um, you know, violin. This is actually a you know, printed on a, a form labs printer. And of course the, the size of this violin, if I were to go ahead and measure, you know, from here to here, uh, or in millimeters, it's 349 millimeters, but that's probably bigger than the build chamber that you would have in a form labs 3d printer. So what, what they were able to do is, you know, show an example of how you could split parts into multiple shapes, right? Obviously you know, it's a resin printer, it's printing plastic uh, components, so you need, like, ways of snapping these parts together. Um, but, you know, printing it in several pieces was something that they uh, did. So I thought this was a really good kind of design for 3D printing uh, example. I think, you know, I, I've done a couple of uh, sessions on that in the past at user groups, Richard, if you remember, you know, on uh, this yep. type of uh, topic where you can prepare your model uh, for 3D printing. But I thought this was really a cool example because, you know, it's got really highly stylized uh, components. And this was done, you know, a long time ago. Um, you know, in fact, you know, we could probably build this in far fewer features with the new surfacing capabilities that we have nowadays. Um, but this was done, you know, long before that. And you see it's 544 features. It rebuilds very quickly, right? You know, the largest... Uh, Rebuild time on a particular feature is this fillet right here at 2.6 seconds on this fairly complex fillet set uh, right here. So um, they also include, you know, um, you know, the assembly and, and things like that. So I, I would highly encourage you to take a look at this. Take a copy if you wish, if you want to, like, make your own version of it and, and work with it. It's really a nice example well built, well constructed. Everything's kind of labeled, <laughs> you know. So the, these are some of the things that I look at when I'm looking for a, a really good model of the week. Something that's, you know, all the parts are identified and named. Features mean something, um, and and this one's really old, and it still met that uh, kind of criteria. So, bet if you redid this nowadays, like I said, you, you'd be able to do even easier, cooler things to make this uh, thing work. So that is the model of the week. We'll put the link there so you can take a peek at it yourselves and I encourage you to take a copy of it, try your own hand at it. I'm not a violin player at all, but yeah, I like the way they look. 
Uh, that is a great model. I just wanted to mention, Mike, I did uh, I did put a note into the uh, forums for people that are interested in having their models featured on our podcast as the uh, model of the week. Uh, it would be really helpful. Uh, number one, it has to be a public document. It would be really helpful if somewhere in the title of that document, you put the letters M-O-T-V, model of the week. Uh, that'll help us find it. Uh, or you can send a link to your public model to us at innovatorsinsider at ptc.com. And look forward to seeing a lot of submissions. Awesome. Hey, tell, tell us about uh, what's going on in the user group. Uh, ah, the user groups. We had a fantastic meeting um, just last week. Anouk Wiprecht, uh, she of fashion tech and robotics and teaching uh, and the spider dress, um, did a wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, the audio was really difficult to hear. Um, so we are going to do some editing with that particular portion. We're going to bump up that audio a little bit, and we are going to feature that presentation uh, at one of our – maybe one or more of our upcoming highlights meetings. Um, also at that same meeting, uh, we had a regular uh, user group attendee, Tabitha Bullness, uh, step up and do a presentation on how she uses FeatureScript and how they've set up their FeatureScript program uh, at their company. And you know what? Uh, people were talking about that session in the forums um, afterwards, and I've already received plenty of requests for the video on that. Uh, so I am putting that together, and I'll make that available to people um, on request. So we had a really great meeting. We've got some good stuff coming up. Um, we have scheduled the tiny house meeting, uh, the first of possibly many. On November 23rd, uh, we've got some participation in the little tiny house project that we've put on, and we've got several Onshape users that are going to come into that meeting and show me what they've designed for my tiny house. Uh, and I'm hoping to see some very practical things, but I'm also hoping to see some uh, some really crazy things as well. So uh, please visit the uh, user group webpage. You'll find the calendar right there. Click on any of the links and you'll uh, find information on the particular meetings. We've got a meeting coming up uh, for German speakers. That meeting will be done entirely in the German language. Uh, and also a new education meeting that was just scheduled. Uh, this will be for students. This is going to be a, a, an interesting meeting. It'll be for uh, students that are really beginners in Onshape. Uh, and we're going to have uh, a top Onshape user kind of go to go through where do I start because that's a question a lot of these students come up with they they have a design in their head they have an idea maybe they even have a paper sketch uh, but when it comes to actually putting that into the uh, into CAD uh, oftentimes they say where do I start so that's what we're going to do with the uh, the use groups coming up amazing all right I'll stop that share but I think uh, I think that's it for today is there anything that we wanted to uh hype up for for the next episode uh well uh we'll have another release update michael uh you'll take us through a, a new on shape release we do that every three weeks at on shape um, release new stuff out into the uh into our user base uh we'll also of course have a model of the week and i'm hoping that we got that uh that interview scheduled uh, uh an industry legend uh journalist uh, a cad journalist that, that that i've known for more than 20 years uh, and I hope we'll uh, we'll definitely be able to get that scheduled. Uh, and who knows? We might do another user group update as well. What do you think? I think that'll I think that'll happen. So, Michael, you know, before we end this thing, are, are you having fun doing the podcast? I, I'm having more fun than I can even describe. I can't even speak. I'm having. Fun. And, and I feel the same way. You know, I was really nervous about doing this, and and we, you know, we said, okay, we'll we'll do it every two weeks because we were really really nervous and. Weren't sure that we could put it all together, but uh, what do you say we take this thing weekly? I think we could do that. It's done. All right. So, uh, <laughs> everybody, we hope you'll uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Chad, thank you so much for for being our guest today, um, and uh, look for us again for a new episode next week. 